So we were playing around with <coughs> rapidity, which I, I had the impression you all thought that was good fun, and indeed it is. So let me remind you what's the relationship between rapidity and velocity. It's the hyperbolic tan of the rapidity is the velocity divided by c. And uh, as we discovered, this slightly bizarre, when you first see it, it's perhaps slightly unexpected new parameter phi, but when you play around with it in the context of the Lorentz transform, all sorts of lovely things happen. And in particular, we discussed, um, I'll need it two or three times, so I'll draw it here. We discussed a situation in which we have three inertial frames uh, in the standard configuration. So S, S dashed, and S double dashed in the usual way, and S dashed is moving with respect to S with some velocity, but we decide not to use velocity, we decide to use rapidity, and we call that phi 1, and S double dashed is moving with respect to S dashed <coughs> with some rapidity, which we call phi 2, and from these we can work out what the velocities are, it's an equivalent parameter. And the question is, what is the relationship, what is the rapidity of S double dashed with respect to S? And rather beautif beautifully, we find that these rapidities just add. Which is one of the best features of this new parameter. It's the, it's the in a sense, the group that is behind this, which is the group consisting of all of the special Lorentz transformations, in other words, the, the Lorentz transformations for the frames in standard configuration, they all form a group. And you can prove that by composing Lorentz transformations in the usual VT form, V, X, that's T, X, Y, Z, with the V as the parameter but it's a mess. But you can see that the Lorentz transforms must form, those special Lorentz transforms must form a group because if you use this parameter, then it's just added. And so it's, it's essentially the additive group on the real numbers. And uh, so that, it, th some people would say that this in some sense is the natural parameter to use for this group because it makes it turn into the simplest representation of this group, namely just additive group on the reals. Okay, so that was what, where we finished up yesterday. People happy with that quick reminder? So uh, I'm going to do an exercise next, number 17. I'll use that picture two or three times during the next half an hour or so. Exercise 17 asks this question, how many velocity increments, I'll explain what this means, of C over 2, do you have to make to get a resultant velocity of 0.99c. So what does, what does this mean? Uh, so ignore this this frame for a minute, just consider these two frames, the usual S and S dashed, and imagine that, uh, not the rapidity here, but the velocity 
of this frame with respect to this one is half the velocity of light. Hello, you haven't missed anything very deep. So uh, imagine that the velocity that this frame is moving with, forget this frame for a moment. This frame is moving with velocity half the velocity of light. Now think that this frame is moving with respect to this frame at half the velocity of light. Well, that does not mean that this frame is moving with respect to this one at the velocity of light because velocities do not add. They can't. We don't know what the formula is yet. Well, you might have looked ahead, but in these lectures we don't yet know what the formula for adding velocities is. But it can't be just addition because it is addition for rapidities. And the relationship with, with velocity is not linear. So, so the velocity of this with respect to this is not light, even though this is half light and this is half light. So you imagine doing this again. You, this is half of light speed with respect to that. This is half of light speed with respect to that. Another one is half of light speed with respect to this. Another one is half of light speed with respect to this. These are this is what I mean by increments. You keep doing this. You keep choosing another frame of reference that's moving at half the velocity of light with respect to the previous one. And the question is, how many, do you, how many times do you have to do that to get a frame of reference somewhere in this sequence that's moving with respect to the original one at 99% of the speed of light? So this is not a deep question. It's just a little bit of fun. It makes you practice the idea of these uh, transformations. And in fact, I'll, I'll work through it. I won't do the next exercise. I'll let you do that. But I will work through this one. So what you do, of course, is you don't think you change the problem to a problem of rapidity. So the problem is given to you in terms of velocities and they don't add, but rapidities do. So you change the problem into rapidities, okay? And this is what happens. So a velocity increment whoops, of a half c is the same as a rapidity increment of uh, the inverse hyperbolic tan of that velocity divided by c, in other words 0.5. So a velocity increment of a half c, so if, 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 um, if v is a half c, then v over c is 0.5, and then the corresponding rapidity increment is the inverse tan of that. So um, a velocity, a resultant velocity of 0.99c is the resultant rapidity of the inverse hyperbolic tan of 0.99. And you want, you want to know how many of these, how many of these will give you this. Now when you're adding, when you're using the repeat, that should say increment. Um, when you're using rapidities, they just add. So I want to know how many times I add this number to itself in order to get this number. So I want to solve the equation for n, that n times the hyperbolic tan, sorry, the inverse hyperbolic tan of 0.5 has got to be greater than the inverse hyperbolic tan 
of 0.99. That's a number n. So n times this has got to be greater than this, and I don't know what n is. That's the, that's the number of increments. And if you solve this, you divide by this number and, and ask a machine to tell you what these are precisely or approximately, then n is an integer, and you find that n is 5. So if you want to get up to 99% of the velocity of light, and you do it in jumps of a half of the velocity of light, you have to do it five times. That's not, I'm not claiming this is a significant result, but it just gets you used to the idea that there's a difference between the velocity and the rapidity. And it's reminding us that the rapidities add, but clearly the velocities don't. Uh, there's also an exercise 18, which I won't um, do uh, in front of you here. I mean, if you ask me to, I can do it tomorrow or something, but it's a similar, it uses the same sorts of ideas, so I'll let you play with that just for, just for fun. Okay. Everybody happy with that? <coughs> now we go back to this drawing and we're going to find out okay so we know straight away that because the rapidities add in this simple way the velocities don't so of course the question is what do the velocities do what is the formula okay so we're going to um, we're going to use this arrangement here we know that the uh, hyperbolic tan of phi is v over c where v is the velocity of this frame with respect to this one we call the velocity of this frame with respect to this one we call it v1 and we call the velocity of this frame with respect to this one we call that 2 okay and so the question is, what's the relationship between V and V1 and V2? Well, um, let's see, I'll do it over here, I guess. So it's very easy. There's a, there's a formula for, there's an addi addition formula for the hyperbolic tan function, which you may remember, the hyperbolic tan of, sorry, hyperbolic tan of the sum of two numbers is the hyperbolic tan of each of them added together, but divided by 1 plus the product. So this is a it's not a difficult formula to prove, okay? Just write, if you like, you can just write down what the hyperbolic tan is in terms of exponentials and it just, it just comes out. Now, if you look at that, and you look at that, and you look at that, then you can see almost immediately that V1 plus V2 is uh, sorry, that V is V1 plus V2 over 1 plus V1 V2 over C squared. You don't get that immediately. What you get immediately is uh, V over C equals V1 over C plus V2 over C uh, is that right? Yeah, 1 plus v1 v2 over c squared. That's what you get immediately, and then you just multiply by c. So we've got this formula. This is how velocities behave. 
we're going to explore this formula um, a little bit, but I'm sure that you are already thinking it's the same problem as we had with the Lorentz transform. How did we not know this before Einstein? Okay. How did we not? So if I'm walking along, I'm in a train and I'm walking along the train at, um, how, how fast do you walk? About two miles an hour or something. Okay, I'm walking along the train and the train's going at 30 miles an hour. So I'm going at 32 miles an hour with respect to the track. Okay, how did, but this tells me, no, I'm not, you see, I'm not. How did we not know this? And of course, the answer is that this is a very large number. So this, for the sorts of velocities that we experience every day, is going to be very small. And so if V1 and V2 are sort of walking and e even, even flying, actually, in, a, in an aircraft or in a ship or anything like that, it's going to be essentially zero. And so, which is one of the beauties of special relativity, it does not upset your everyday life, but it profoundly changes um, the framework, the philosophical framework in which you're your physics happens. Okay, so um, now one thing you can do with this formula, which is very nice, I'll just show you straight away. Uh, it's an exercise, but I can't resist doing it. If you're quick, you can do it faster than me. So the exercise is to use this formula to explain why the velocity of light does not change as you move from one frame to another. So what you do is you put v2 equal to c, okay, which is breaking the rules a little bit because v2 was supposed to be the velocity of a frame of reference. But just allow me to do this for a moment. We can come back to that point. If you put v equal, v2 equal c, then v1, sorry, then v is v1 plus c over 1 plus uh, v1, sorry, v1 over c. Is that right? Yeah. Which is c times v1 plus c over c plus v1, which is c. So this formula has the property, if you're adding two velocities and one of them is the velocity of light, then the other one is also the velocity of light. Okay, the outcome is the velocity of light. So, if um, so, for example, if, if you're looking, I was discussing this with one of you. I can't remember who. You're looking at. You're standing on a, a railway station platform, and there's a fast train coming towards you, and you're measuring the light coming from the front. It's night time, so there's a big light on the front of the train. You're measuring the velocity of the light coming to you from the train. It's going to be c, because th you add the velocity of the train to the velocity of the light, but then you divide by this number, and it turns out, according to this calculation, that you get just c again. So that that formula explains how how it works. That uh, all of the frames of reference have the same. Uh, velocity for light. Now, uh, there's a different way of getting this formula, which is quite uh, instructive, and in particular, it allows us to to do that exercise properly. Um, what we do is we we replace that third frame of reference with a particle. So instead of this third frame of reference here, s double dashed, we just ha take a particle, which is at the origin of this frame, and we imagine that that partic particle, so we forget that it's got its frame of reference, we just think of it as a particle moving with velocity v2 or rapidity phi2 with respect to this frame. So now we've only got two frames of reference, and we can do the following simple analysis. Um, so uh, s dashed 
measures the speed of the particle to be v2 um, <coughs> And so dx dashed, dt dashed is equal to v2. But now you use the Lorentz transformation in the infinitesimal form and you get that dx dashed is gamma um, times dx minus v dt. Uh, wait, 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 v1 dt, because it's this Lorentz transform with that relative velocity. And dt dashed is gamma dt minus v1 dx over c squared. And that's equal to v2. So all I've done is I've written this equation down, but I've used the Lorentz transform here to get that, and I've used the Lorentz transform here to get that. It's exactly the Lorentz transform, but with the infinitesimals instead of um, finite quantities. And then you divide everything by dt here, and you get this. You cancel the gammas, and you get dx dt minus v1 over um, 1 minus v1 dx dt over c squared is equal to v2. But dx dt is um, just what um, this frame of reference calculates for the velocity of the, for the speed of the particle. So dx dt is just v, so you've got v minus v1 over 1 minus v1 v over c squared equals v2, because dx dt is just the velocity that s thinks the particle is moving at. And then if you make uh, v the subject of this equation with a little piece of algebra, you get this. Okay. And actually that's how we should be thinking of this, um, this exercise here. So in this exercise here, that particle is a photon. It's moving at the velocity of light. Okay, so let me just um, come back to this formula. It's, it's obviously of fundamental importance. And I've already pointed out that uh, unless one or both of these is large, a large fraction of the velocity of light, then this will be small and we don't see it. So the question next is, um, is, there a, is there a situation in which, an, is there an everyday situation in which one of these is a large fraction of the velocity of light? And amazingly, rather beautifully, there is. So this, this velocity c that I've been talking about in every sentence almost the last two to three days is the velocity of light in vacuum. I don't think I emphasized that. In fact, I may not even have said it at all. It's the velocity of light in vacuum. Um, so what happens if you're not in a vacuum. Well, in, in a transparent medium such as water or glass, light moves quite fast but not quite as fast as C. In other words, when light travels through a transparent medium it is slowed down a little bit. Um, so, it's, so it's moving at a very high proportion of C not quite at C. And in fact, that's how these things work. I can't see you now. That's how these things work. The fact that 
light behaves differently as it moves through a different medium is exactly how lenses work, as I'm sure you know. Um, so can we use that? And the answer is yes, we can. What we do is we imagine um, a laboratory which has got a pipe in it and it's full of water. Okay, and the end is closed off. So it, it's got water in it. And we measure the velocity of light. Let's choose a different colour for light. Have we got a yellow? Maybe we've got a yellow here. Maybe yellow's not different enough. So we imagine that we've got a source of light inside here and the light is travelling along here inside the water and we measure its velocity. Let me check my notes so that I get the letters the right way around, excuse me. <coughs> Suppose that the speed of light in a liquid is u dashed. So th this speed here is u dashed. That's the speed of... so at this, at this stage the water is at rest, it's not moving. So you're in the laboratory, you've got this big pipe, you've got a light source and you measure, presumably using an interferometer or something, how fast the light moves through the water. And you write it down. Then you somehow, you, you pump so that the water now itself is moving. Right? Presumably you don't want it to be moving with turbulence, you want it to be moving with smooth laminar flow, otherwise there'd be some complications <laughs> involved. <laughs> and, uh, and you make the water move uh, with velocity v with respect to your laboratory. And once you're happy that it's settled down and it's moving smoothly, again you switch the light on and you measure the velocity of the light as it's travelling through the water with respect to uh, the laboratory and then you get uh, uh, V. <coughs> okay, so V, so, so to go back through that, if the water's not moving, the light with respect to the laboratory moves with that velocity. If the water is moving with velocity v, oh it can't be v, hold on I've done something stupid. Yeah this is u. <coughs> you know, so then you, you make the water move with velocity v and then you, then you measure the velocity of the light through the water relative to the laboratory. And so uh, what's the relationship between u and these two numbers, okay? And it turns out that the relation, so the experimental result is that it is that they behave like this, these numbers. So uh, you, what you get is that u is equal to, so that's the sort of resultant velocity, u dashed plus v 1 minus 1 over n squared where n is the refractive index of the water. So n is c over u dashed. So the refractive index of a transparent medium is the ratio between the velocity of light in vacuum and the velocity of light in that medium. And it, when you go to the optician to have your glasses repaired or replaced, if, like me, your eyesight has got a little bit worse, then you, then you either have to have more curvature on your lens or you have to have a higher refractive index, okay? And if you're prepared to pay more money, you have a higher refractive index. <laughs> but the refractive index is just, is just this ratio here. And, and, and you get this result. And amazingly, this was known in 1851 this experiment was performed by the physicist Fizzo <coughs> uh, 
So it's a long time before special relativity, the instruments were already good enough to measure this, and this was the result that Fizzo got. And of course, in the context of thinking about light moving through um, an ether, it's very confusing. Not very confusing. Um, however, if if you don't worry about that, if you've abandoned the ether, you've completely thrown it away, then you can very quickly get this result just by using this formula. Okay, and that's um, an exercise. Okay, you have to. I'll give you a hint. This this formula is actually light approximation. So you you use this, you tailor expand this, this um, denominator here. So you write it as V1 plus, I mean, you change the letters, of course. And then instead of writing it as this over this, you write it as this multiplied by this to the power minus one. And then you use the binomial expansion. And then you just take the, the, the V terms and not the V squared terms. So you just truncate and you almost immediately get this. So it's a, it's a, from the point of view of special relativity, this is a very nice little baby exercise in using that formula. If you have any difficulty with that calculation, I'm perfectly happy to do it, but it'd be more fun if you did it. So I'll leave you to do it. So this is great because here's an everyday I mean, it's not every day that you're in a laboratory with light and water, I agree, but it's, it doesn't involve anything terribly dramatic, and the experiment was done a long time ago. <coughs> okay, so now, um, is, is there are questions about this? Okay, good, let's move on. So, um, I'll say one more thing about this velocity formula here. And that is, um, so far we've had all of our light and particles and water and everything all moving along in one dimension. Everything's been moving along in one dimension. How do you cope if things are moving in different directions? <coughs> well, suppose you've got... Um, a particle moving through the frame S with velocity in the X direction given by, sorry, speed in the X direction given by that, speed in the Y direction given by that, and speed in the Z direction given by that. Okay. So if you've got a, a particle moving through this reference frame, with some velocity, then those will be the components of the velocity. If you like, you can think of those as forming a vector, an ordinary three-dimensional vector, u. Do I call it u? I do. I don't know why. You don't really need that. Um, in other words, what I'm going to do is I'm going to think of this as u1, u2, u3. So u1 is that number, that's u2 and that's u3. And now you just write down the same thing but everything is in the other frame of reference and you'll get a, a new vector u dashed and it's going to be dx dashed, sorry delta x dash delta t dashed. You could do this with infinitesimals if you prefer, it doesn't change anything really. And that will be u1 dashed, u2 dashed, and u3 dashed. And what's the relationship between these? Well, it's a very simple exercise. You just use the Lorentz transform on all of these. Right? You've got a formula for delta x dashed in terms of these things. You've got a formula for delta t dashed. Remember not to forget to change delta t dashed. 
in all of these things and so on. Uh, and the exercise is to work it out. Um, I'll write it down over here. I'll do one of them just to show you how it goes. So let's do the middle one, the, the uh, U2, shall we? So U2 dashed is uh, delta Y over dashed over delta T dashed, which is now the Lorentz transform behaves very easy. Delta Y dashed is the same as delta Y. Delta T dashed though is a bit more complicated. It's gamma delta T minus V delta X over C squared. Yeah, if you just use the standard Lorentz transform on that. Then you divide everything by delta T and you get delta Y over delta T divided by gamma into 1 minus V delta X over delta T over C squared. And then delta Y over delta T is U2 and delta X over delta T is U1. So this formula just becomes U2 over gamma 1 minus V U1 over C squared. And in the exercise it asks you to work out, I've done the middle one, it asks you to work out this one and this one. This one's almost going to be identical except y gets changed to z. This one's a slightly different answer, but it's easy for you to find. It's, the answer's in the lecture notes.